Okay, I think we're live. Welcome to the end of summer edition of our twice monthly Facebook Live. I'm Paul Rutherford, co-founder of ScanPower, and we are really glad you can join us. If you want to come on screen or just pop in and ask some questions, I'm posting the Zoom link in the comments. And joining me today is James McConnell Jr., who many of you know as an Amazon FBA and all-around logistics wizard. He's a longtime user and advisor to ScanPower and will help us dig into the wholesale prep and ship model. Uh, towards the end of the call, I'll be announcing a new thing we're doing with real life warehouses and giving away some of these new hats. We'll also have a discount offer for ScanPower, so stay, stay tuned. Um, so wholesale logistics is our topic today. It's supposed to be simple, right? Higher volumes, lower SKU counts, repeatable processes and all that. And while these are all true, there's still some complexity complexity hidden in the mix of, of wholesale products. Um, for example, expiring products and um, labeling and packing uh, challenges. And so, James, what, what would you say? Welcome, James, by the way. Uh, and yep. what would you say are three big pain points with wholesale logistics? Well, especially different than from like RA or OA or whatever is... Um, your process to manage your inventory coming in and dealing with claims needs to be efficient because every vendor has a specific claim process and some of them have short claim windows. So some vendors, hey, you need to file a claim in 30 days. Not a big deal. Some vendors, you need to file a claim within two days or three days. That's more complicated. Um, and then um, volume. So shipping out five UPS boxes, 10 UPS boxes, easy. Label the boxes, you're done. But with pallet level quantities, or you have truck scheduling, you have truck delays, you have pickups, you have deliveries. Um, if you're doing full truckload, it's you have, a, have to have the space to stage a whole truck. And then yeah. um, wholesale in general is going to be typically slightly higher quantity per SKU. However, you are going to encounter probably a lot more prep types in that sense and say, hey, don't be deterred by glass. Don't be deterred by multi-packs. Um, people like to focus on the easy prep, which don't get me wrong, we all like easy prep, but at the same time, sometimes the, the more time intensive prep has substantially more margin associated with it, which can still make it worth it. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. We've had discussions about um, kind of the lead times and just crazy preparedness you have to do to to do glassware and to do, you know, fragile items. But if you get it right, margins are higher. Uh, you, you have more of a moat. You have uh, bo both as a as a product and as a 3PL, you know, so it's, it's twofold for, for folks like you who are, um, you know, prepping and shipping for other people. Well, let's, Absolutely. let's, let's dig in just a little bit on the claims process. So um, tell us how you're, you're handling this um, both, you know, for your seller account and for some of your clients and, and maybe offer some examples of, ones that have proved problematic in the past? So there are some vendors that we just don't generally suggest our clients to buy from if they're going through us. Because if, he, if a vendor requires a 24-hour claim window, it's very hard to prioritize. Have we accommodated certain situations? Absolutely, but it's very difficult to do that because from a 3PL, 3PL's perspective, you can't see what's coming in. You don't have a good way to plan. Even if you do get to plan, you might only get a couple days. Um, if you control your own freight or you can give the facility heads up, they might be able to accommodate. So that's just a couple of things to think about there. But um, probably the biggest factor is, is when do you collect the information for claims? A lot of people will collect them right up the truck. Now, obviously, when the truck is being unloaded, you want to spot check for obvious damages. But it's not realistic to know if the entire shipment is good or if there's damages. You will only know there, if there's damages, truly, uh, not when you sort out the pallet, you sort it out by skew or whatever. Well, what if all right. the boxes are fine on the outside? 
there's this term called concealed damage. Concealed damage is damage that's not seen on the outside, or it's not even seen on the case. It's sometimes damage on the inside of the case. Mm -hmm. A bag was cut, a bottle was leaking, but it didn't leak enough to wet the box, or um, a seal broke, or a lid is cracked. All those things you will not find out truly until everything is prepped. So with that said, you have to consider how do I get the stuff moving through my facility at an efficient rate in proportion to the claim windows for my suppliers? If your suppliers are 30 days, it's a lot easier, but you obviously wanna get it done as soon as possible to get that money back so you can deploy that capital elsewhere. So your process needs to be conducive to truly audit any damages, which means getting that inventory in and looking at every single item. The problem is, is a lot of people just look at the cases and say, hey, whatever, cool. Well, you will lose money to losses for true concealed damage versus if you can get that prepped very quickly, whether that's more staff, whether it's a good process, et cetera, then you know that, hey, this shipment had 2,500 items um, and uh, we, we ended up prepping it and there was actually 2,498 that were good. There's two damage, we can now go file the claims because we process this in a, in a good amount of time. Yeah, and this may be an extreme example, but I had a onboarding call with a customer yesterday who, when they place the supplier order, the product can ship from any one, I think he said 24 different warehouses. And so, and, and, and the supplier puts the onus on him to figure out which of those shipments, was it a shipment from Texas? Was it a shipment from Washington state to figure, to find where the damaged product was. So he, he has to segment his receiving process down, you know, very granular and basically keep those products separated when they're received until he can determine what's missing, what's damaged. And then even crazier, he had to, he basically had to collect all the evidence down to the UPS manifest and yep. and use that to submit to the supplier. So it, it just, you know, it can eat up so much time if you don't have a process in place or if you just have a claim window that's too small. And Well, plus you're also thinking about that process has to be scalable and that process is not making you money at all. No matter what you're, if you're running a 3PL, if you're running your own seller account, it doesn't matter. It's not making you money. So the less you can do of claims or the less work you have to do towards claims, assuming claims are going to be inevitable, which they basically are, then the better off you could be. Some parts you have to be in the warehouse for. Other parts you can do remotely, have a VA, have a remote employee, have something like that. But at the end of the day, the slowest part of that process is the physical warehouse process, and you want to simplify that as much as possible. Do you do you ever just reject products that that where the claim window is too short, or or where where it's just too much, or or is it end up just being something you're responsible for? You have to up charge the customer. You have to. Um, so you, two you have to deal with it, even though it completely slows down your, your lines. For, for external clients, we say, look, we aren't equipped to accommodate 24-hour claim windows. It's just, I'm sorry. I, there's a lot of facilities out there that will say that they can process shipments in 24 hours or 48 hours. However, I like to joke about this, but it's a fact. They've never been delivered a truckload of glass like I have. And that truckload of glass will take more than 24 hours. And the thing is, is it's an unpredictable truckload. I don't know when I'm going to get that truckload in. It's just going to show up and it's going to be a truckload of glass. There's no facility that can just magically plan for that on an instant notice. So, however, we have done shipments where there is a short claim window, whether it was for my inventory or for select clients, whether there's a premium on the braid or et cetera. That, that's, that aside, it does require significant planning. It requires, hey, when is the shipment coming? How many pallets is this shipment? Roughly how many units or whatever? Do I have the staff prepared for it? 
do I have that schedule lined up that that shipment is going to get bumped up in priority over the other stuff that we have to do? And then finally, um, my team's goal is to get everything prepped quickly. Boss contents doesn't have to be done, but the prep has to be done. And then we have a remote person file the claims. So can it be done? Absolutely. It just requires more planning and more insight and visibility of when is stuff coming in? What is our staff going to look like? What does our production queue look like? All those different components come together. And no, it's not on a fancy chart or a computer system. It's just understanding the flow in order to make sure that you prioritize what needs to be prioritized. I have a vendor that requires it in seven days. So that we can probably accommodate for. But if we are over, if we have a ton of prep to do and that comes in, we're going to say, hey, we don't need to get to that today, but we probably need to get that to that before this other stuff that we were planning to do because that has a seven day window. Seven days, that's a comp that can be accommodated. 24 hours, really, really hard unless you're doing that in-house, which even if you're doing it in-house, it's going to cost you money. You have to figure out a way to file those claims in 24 hours or you just eat the loss. Which is a, yeah, just a choice that, you know, some sellers are going to make because, you know, they're paying more to have it researched and to submit the evidence than they are for the dozen or so products that are missing or damaged. Um, yeah, so so wholesale um, quantities are larger. Um, what what are some of the challenges when you're dealing with large quantities of items? I know you and I talk a lot about the prep side. Uh, maybe we can start with that. Prepping and labeling and. Yeah, the uh, it, it comes down to you have information of what you bought, information that what you have, which we have a rule in our warehouse, packing list are always wrong unless they're right. But until they're exactly. proven, they're wrong. So we, we ignore packing lists. We put them in, in a bin or whatever. Um, and we go off of what we have. Now, often what we have matches what we ordered, but there are many times where you get the wrong item, wrong size, wrong quantity, damaged, except there's so many various types of defects. Um, there's a problem with the listing, whatever, et cetera. However, at the end of the day, you have to figure out what you have. Now that receiving process can look a variety of different ways. Carts, tables, shelves, uh, conveyors, um, pallets, whatever. You have to figure out what you have. Then you can print those labels. Could you print them before? Sure, but you may have extra because what if you were shorted? What if you got delivered extra? You have to print those labels. Uh, the act of prepping, poly bags, bubble bags, bubble wrap, et cetera, all that stuff is done at the individual SKU level. You need to be able to communicate that for each product to the person that's prepping it. So for us, it's an admin communicating it to a prepper. Is that verbally? Is that written? Is that on a computer? Is that on a spreadsheet? It's a variety of ways you can do that. And at the end of the day, that stuff has to get prepped and boxed and box contents. So how you design that flow can be done a variety of different ways. We've obviously done a lot of iterations and stuff like that, but um, the, the goal is, is you have probably about four key phases. You're unloading the truck and receiving it in, in some sort of way to comparing it against what you bought and printing the labels for those items. Is that uh, that's kind of one big summarized first step mm -hmm. because that's your your beginning step. Then you have prep. I'm gonna leave that as is. Very very simple. Sometimes it needs a poly bag. Sometimes it's a two pack. Whatever. It's prep. And then you have box contents. There's so many other variables in all of those individually as well. But at the end of the day, you have three different zones. Now, whether that is a physical zone in the warehouse, whether that is a person whether that is a table or a station, um, that's up to you to design. However, those three steps don't change. Now that order could possibly change slightly, but at the end, you can't do box contents before you print the labels. 
You don't know the box contents. You can't do prep before you do the labels. And you can't, you could do prep after you do box contents, but you have to know what's the box contents. So you either have to collect that data or you have to do it after you prep. So there's, it's at the end of the day, that's your three phases that are most likely for most sellers going to go in that order. And you take each individual phase and optimize it separately before you try to conquer the whole thing. If you try to optimize the whole thing, it's overwhelming. If you say, hey, we're going to focus on improving box contents today or this week or this month, you optimize that area. Don't worry about the other two. Then focus on the other two at a later point or, or, or another section. Yeah. You get the point. No, that's, that's good advice. Um, and on the prep side of things, we got a request yesterday that um, hopefully will get done quickly. But um, this person was trying to do the scheduling, the planning uh, for the warehouse for the shippers based on the prep types of the uh, of the inventory he was ordering. So he's like, in my batch or uh, in my PO, I want to I want to sort by prep type or even filter by prep type. So I know, okay, we've got, you know, a thousand glass in, in this shipment or in this order, we've got a thousand glassware items to prep. We've got a hundred items that need poly bags. Then we have, you know, another 1500 that just need labeling. And so um, I think we're going to do this, you know, little filter or, or sorting and filtering feature, you know, based on that feedback, but it's all about you know, being able to look at the the quantity of work that's going to be done in the time period that you have. So we talked about, um, you know, damaged and return policies, but we also, you know, we want to know, okay, we're going to need four additional temp workers tomorrow because we're prepping, we're, you know, we're doing the most difficult prep and then we won't need them, you know, Wednesday, yeah. Thursday. Uh, the the biggest so, thing is, is we have, let's just say you get five truckloads of stuff. I'm using an egregiously large number to kind of make a point. How do you prioritize this? For us, we have ways to prioritize. I know people that prioritize their own inventory and say, hey, we're going to prioritize the products that are the closest to running out of stock first. Cool. Some will prioritize based on prep type. Cool. We want to get all the label onlys done or whatever. Or vice versa. You want to get all the glass out of the way. Either way works. Um, we do prioritization as well. What is going, if we need to fill a truck, like we had two trucks go out yesterday, one truck, we had to get done in two days. So I said, look, we're going to focus on the stuff that fills the truck the fastest, not right. the stuff that needs five sheets of bubble wrap, taping, boxing, poly bag, whatever. I want to focus on the stuff that I can fill a pallet in 30 minutes, an hour or whatever, because it's fast. So we plan to fill trucks and to get stuff out. Sometimes that means shifting things back or forward and priority slightly and say, hey, that glass stuff over there, I know we're going to need time for. So I'm not going to do it when we are cramped on time. Right. But the opposite is also true. We got these pallets over here that, hey, they're ready to go. They're, they're almost done. They're super easy to process. We can get the box contents done in 15 minutes. And then get wrapped and done. Cool. If I need to fill a truck, I'm going to go grab those. Um, but there's different ways to prioritize. And it's really going to depend on your model. The guy who's sending his own inventory based on stock levels is going to see that a lot differently than us or is going to see it a lot differently than uh, a person who can't get enough staff in. So they want to focus on label only. Very different strategies, but all very viable and very important. Well, and I assume that you know, like when you're sending for your seller account, it, you, you might um, you might you might optimize for cash flow, right? You might say, "Yep, I, I've got four pallets of goods. I need to get in. I, I know these, you know, amplifiers or whatever are going to be a little higher margin. I'll send those before I send the the snack mix or the you know the low margin you know consumable stuff." And then, oh yeah. And then, you know, that that makes a difference when, um, you know, that stuff is received and goes live in this cycle versus the next one. And even comparing LTL versus SPD, we may prioritize, let's say we have an oversized LTL. I want to get that done because if I schedule it, it ain't going to pick up today. 
It may not even pick up tomorrow. It may yeah. pick up a, a while from now. But if I do the SPD now, it'll go out today. If I do the LTL today first and then the SPD, the SPD still may go out today, but worst case scenario, it'll go out tomorrow. So like worst case scenario, the SPD will go out on the latest of tomorrow and the pallet will go out as soon as it was possible versus delaying the pallet. Oh, now it adds an extra day or two. Well, what if that pallet's a $50,000 pallet? Right. It's, that, that's cash flow intensive. So we've had times where we say, hey, I want to do this SPD. I want to do this UPS stuff, but I want to prioritize these pallets first just because I want to finish those and get them done and wrapped up. Because I know that, hey, if UPS comes at, I don't know, 3.30, 4.30 in the day, um, we might still get it. And even if we don't, it's okay. It'll go out tomorrow. Right. uh, Teresa, who uh, said hello in the comments, is is in the waiting room. So we're going to let her in if she's still waiting. (laughs) Uh, oh, hey, Teresa. I wasn't expecting to do this. Like, I saw your note yesterday and said, hey, I'm getting back into um, Amazon going deep. Had some um, life life changes. And now I'm actually closing on a new house next week with a 15 by 50 foot RV garage that I'm going to use for my warehouse. So I'm getting ready to amp up my Amazon business again. Well, you've come to the right place. Um, I know I had to come figure out what you guys have been doing for the last right, primarily because yeah. James here uh, you're in Arizona still yeah yeah James is in Texas and uh, he's very good at helping people figure out you know warehouse layout optimizing space optimizing efficiency so you guys should talk uh, you know some after the call for sure yeah absolutely I also want to um, try to uh, do some of the stuff that uh, Perry does with the lean you know, where every, every motion, every step, every reach is calculated. Now I'm not going to have a, a, a business like his, but um, I don't know. Yeah. Every business is different and um, it's, it's amazing how they, uh, they evolve based on the conditions, based on Amazon, based on your, you know, supplier availability. It, it's, you know, I, I haven't talked to James in a couple of weeks and I bet he's doing like 10 new things that I haven't even heard of. So. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like I've been out of the loop. I, um, you know, before, before COVID, I no actually during COVID is when I stopped resourcing and I was taking care of my mom and I just wasn't, I just haven't been outsourcing at all. And so, um, you know, I really want to get back into that game and, well, I think I want to get back to that whole RA stuff is a lot of work now. But. Well, that's why, I mean, we're talking about wholesale today and and that may be a model, as you said, going a little deeper and fewer SKUs and repeatable processes. It, it may be something that works for you. Yeah, and I think that, um, that that's definitely where I'm headed to. I've been making a lot of connections. Um, I just received an order of 750 athletic wear, Adidas, Nikes, Under Armour, and I'm processing that right now in my living room, which mm-hmm. is a disaster because I don't have any room. Uh, but, you know, that was that was a, a connection that I made and um, it looks pretty good, pretty good price. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to do is try to get it to come to me. I don't cool, know, I'm very cool. Testing it all out. I'm testing it all out. I'm going to try all new things. I'm open for everything. I've got capital. I just got to find the right deals. So... And I definitely want to use the, you know, the scan power. And it's like, I know you improve it all the time. And I feel like I'm definitely out of the loop with it. I just need to get back in to figure out, and even just the Amazon rules that have changed. I just, I feel like I'm starting over with a grandfathered in a Amazon account. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and the the list is long in terms of what, what has changed. <clears throat> uh, there's a new... There's a new like shipment workflow in Seller Central that doesn't look a lot like the 
the workflow that you're used to in ScanPower. And the APIs still support kind of the traditional workflow, although Amazon has tweaked a lot what you can and can't do there. And so you have these kind of separate and, and not connected workflows between Seller Central and, and you know, third-party apps like ScanPower that we think those are going to start overlapping more by the end of the year. Okay. But um, yeah, since, since you've used us, they've updated all the APIs. Um, there's been, you know, more restrictions and more challenges uh, as you can imagine, but um, the, the process still looks similar that, you know, you, you need to tell us what you want to ship and we help you figure out how to prep it and label it. And then Amazon tells us where you're going to send it to. And, and there are some tricks for getting it, you know, getting fewer split shipments and getting, getting things to go where you want them to go. But in general, um, that process still looks the same and you have to tell Amazon what's in each box and in what quantities. So. Yeah, that all um, makes sense. And uh, to, com to not to complicate this, but to, to, to make my learning curve a little steeper is I pulled all my uh, warehouse inventory during COVID. And so for the last three years, I've been doing uh, merchant fulfilled, but I only have about 300, 350 items. So I'm shipping the stuff that I do list. I am shipping it. And I was going to start shipping in during Q4, but the um, it's just, it's too much for me to learn in Q4. And I'm not in moving and, you know, all that other stuff. So I decided that I'm, I will start sending my stuff in, um, in probably January, February. And then, um, then I'll definitely need to learn all the new ways of having to box and package and everything. I'd like to hear James's uh, thoughts, but my, my initial thought is, you know, maybe you don't do FBA, but you let a prep center do some FBA for you. And yeah, I was, I was in that way, you're kind of staying in the game when you're going to get the most bump in sales, but you're also not having to learn it yourself. That's a very good point. I was just at FlipCon um, and in um, North Carolina and uh, Chaz and Trista, who has it, who have a prep center, were there. And I was just talking that to them about the, their process. And that's kind of where I thought, oh, well, if I get some these big orders or whatever, that's definitely something I should look into. So, yeah. Typically we su suggest people one, always start out by learning, learning the shipment yourself. If you can prep st stuff yourself, great to learn. However, that isn't always necessarily the best long-term solution. Um, I know seven, eight and nine figure sellers that do it in house. I know seven, eight and nine figure sellers that outsource. It has no indication of your capability of success on the platform if you outsource or in or insource it in-house. At the end of the day, it's going to come down to your time. So people think, oh, I can get this prep for, for 50 cents if I do it in-house, but I can do it for 75 cents if I do it, if I outsource it. It's going to cost me 25 cents. But what's the overhead? What's your utilities? What's your insurance? What's your staff? Who's going to run the place? What's your time worth? Um, now, for someone that wants to run a warehouse, that's fine. <laughs> if you don't want to run a warehouse, then outsource it. It will cost you a little bit more than in-house in uh, prep. However, if you get a facility and you get to the point where you're scaling quite well, sometimes that facility could actually process your stuff for a similar rate as for you to do it yourself because they've had an economies of scale. Um, our, my team can scale up and down very, very rapidly, which person who has their own space and one employee, it makes it very, very hard for y'all to double, triple your scaling or your size um, when you're small because you don't have that nimbleness of being, you can be creative and frugal, but you can't like double your output overnight. That's very, very difficult. Now, James, do you run a fulfillment center? I run a 3PL in Texas. Prep Center, I'm yes. sorry. Prep Center? Yeah. Okay, because let me just tell you, just this conversation, when I was at FlipCon, it was just an idea. This is exactly how I have to go because I've got my, my hand in so many different pots. This is where I want to go 
this is where I can make the most money the fastest. And I made this pie in the sky goal to get this house paid off in five years, which isn't, I mean, I say it's pie in the sky. It's pie in the sky if I work at the level I'm working at now. But if I do what I was doing pre-COVID, it's not a hard thing at all. Just use, I'm sorry, just using my Amazon money. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, so that's kind of like just a fun goal I threw out there without even thinking about it. I'm like, I could do this. So I think that just in this conversation, like, yeah, I don't need to relearn all this stuff. I just need to find the right prep center. Yeah. And you have to find the facility that's best fit for your model and your needs. For example, um, we, we turn away a lot of customers. It's not because we don't like customers. It's just because, look, I would rather, I have clients that come to me and say, hey, I'm just starting out. I want to send you a um, hundred units this month. I said, look, yeah. we can do that. And that's fine. However, we're not, our process is not designed for that. We're designed for pallet level quantities, uh, not necessarily of an individual SKU, but just in general. We're designed for high throughput, high workflow. We aren't great at apparel. Uh, we aren't great with like shoes. We aren't great at a variety of different specific things. But what we are good at, we are very good at. And there are facilities um, that deal better with high variety, for example. I know people that do extremely high variety SKU count. They have tens of thousands of SKUs in their cellar central. But they have processes designed to manage that. And that not only includes from digital processes like repricing and catalog management, but also prep processes. And they do great for that. And I'll send clients to them and say, hey, look, this client has lots of variety, but he's got good volume. On the flip side, a client that's their average quantity is 60 units or 100 units per SKU, that may be better equipped for us because it's like, look, we're wholesale focused. It doesn't have to be that way. But at the same time, you need to find a facility that's equipped for your needs. I'm in Texas. It's not sales tax free. So I'm not good for your OA, RA type stuff. Um, but I'm also in Texas. It's centrally located. So if you have stuff on the West Coast or the East Coast, it's actually in the middle. However, if, you're on the, if you have an East Coast warehouse and your supplier is on the West Coast or vice versa, that's not ideal either. You have to factor in shipping. That may be okay. So there are a lot of variables that come into play with each business. And that's why there isn't, there will never be a one size fits all. Um, and every facility has to stand out on their own, um, not terms, but own differences. So if you ever talk to a facility, say, hey, what is your ideal customer? And what makes you special for that ideal customer? Because Good questions. Yeah. If, if I'm looking for a facility, I want to make sure that I'm your ideal customer because one, I'm going to get the most benefit out of you. And two, you're going to have the least problems processing my stuff. If I say, hey, my ideal customer is not shoes. Have we done shoes? Sure. But I, I'm not as good as some other facilities that do lots of shoes. The guys doing the truckload of shoes all the time are better at shoes than I am. So I may forward that client to them. Now, that's never to say we don't process shoes. We've done shoes, we've done apparel, we've done it all. But the clients are aware of that and they say, okay, I, I understand that if I send shoes to this warehouse, it's probably gonna be processed a little bit slower, but I'm okay with that because they're good at all the other stuff. That's fine. You just have to find your wins and, and uh, not losses, but pros and cons. Um, but you need to find the facility that is best fit for your model. There are other facilities that specialize and bundling and multi-packs and say, hey, our pricing is better for those because all of our processes are around those. Okay, cool. If I need a pricing that's generalized pricing, okay, better pricing there, cool. Um, I need pricing that's better for label only because mm -hmm. I have most of my inventory is label only. Okay, so the guys who have better pricing for bundles probably have to charge more per label only to factor in the cost and, and averages. Then the guy who itemizes it out and says, my bundles are maybe a little bit more, but my label only is a little bit lower. So you have to analyze your own inventory to figure out what is a facility fit for me? If someone says they can do everything, they can't. Okay, fine. I, I, can, I can do everything. But if you ask them, what are they yeah. the best at? If they say everything, run. Because no one's the best at everything. 
we're the best at a very, very fine tuned, like specific type of category. It doesn't mean we only do grocery or only do home or whatever. It's just a very specific type of ordering and volume and all that stuff. We're really good at that. But if, some, if you ask another facility and say, well, we can handle everything. Cool. I can too. I've done fishing poles, 85 inches long. It doesn't mean that we're the best for that. Can we do it? Yes. A lot of facilities can do everything, but you need to find what each facility is best at and then see, does that best thing benefit me? Because I'm the customer. I need to look for a facility that is best fit for my model that has a competitive advantage that affects me. If, if you come to me with a hundred units a month, you're not going to benefit from all of our LTL and truckload benefits. Because yeah. you're not sending in enough. It, it doesn't benefit you. Therefore, we're just like just like any other facility. That and makes Teresa, sense. I, I pasted the link in the in the Facebook live chat. Um, there are a bunch of prep centers and 3PLs that work with scan power. And, and you can you can kind of while that list doesn't tell you what they're good at and who their target customer is, you can use that, you know, locations and contact info to kind of whittle down and interview the ones that you you may want to work with. Um, and, and then Perry also had a good comment that Texas has a process for recouping sales tax that some other states don't. So while Texas isn't tax-free, um, you can get that some of that back. Yeah, that's interesting. I had no idea that that was the case in Texas. So I don't know much about that. I I've heard it's possible. I just know that a lot of paperwork involved. So I, could it be done? Yes, but maybe ask a CPA. Also, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, anyways, this is all very interesting and fascinating, and it's actually um, got me thinking in a totally different direction in just five minutes. <laughs> well, that's what we're here for. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the wholesale model, we're seeing a lot, I guess, you know, as scan power, like we're seeing a lot of new um, wholesale sellers. We're seeing wholesale kind of have its day in the sun, so to speak. Um, we're also, uh, and James is actually organizing this conference, but we're also getting ready to go to a conference called Amazon United, which is going to be in um, New Jersey coming up next uh, Wednesday, Thursday. The conference is on Thursday. There's kind of a little bit of a pre-conference on, on Wednesday. That's the 30th and the 31st. Um, so James, feel free to put a link in the, the chat to that. But um, so part of it, I, I think, is is just the timing around you know, us being involved in the conference, but I think, I think there's, you know, definitely a lot going on right now in Amazon wholesale and, and it comes down to, you know, there, there's too much inventory for the suppliers or the distributors to handle. They need help getting it into the right channels. And there are, you know, and we're, we're still in this kind of wicked steep, growth curve of e-commerce so there's there's more supply coming into different marketplaces than there are you know the the seller capacity to keep up with it so it all makes sense it's all part of the larger trend but we're certainly seeing um you know more sellers more customers of ours that are wholesalers and and we've used that you know we've used that insight to create some features that um, I wanted to plug a little bit on the, the show today. So I'm going to share my screen, um, but it, it might be interesting for you to see this, Teresa, just because, you know, you've, you've seen older versions of scan power, I think. So yeah. you just, uh, bring this up. So Here's a batch that that I've created um, in ScanPower that's wholesale products, and I'll just quickly point out that you know these these can be listed 
individually through the, the top interface here. Um, as soon as they the products are listed into a batch, we're going to tell you um, where the where Amazon is telling us in terms of a shipping plan. We call it a shipment preview where those items are going. And at all stages, you're going to be able to provide, you know, in this case, I'm using uh, consumable or expiring products. So you're going to be able to supply expiration dates where they're needed. We're going to tell you if something requires an expiration date um, or labeling or whatnot through Amazon's prep guidance. I know James is not a big fan of this because it, it it's not 100% accurate from Amazon. Um, but if you're kind of new to new to FBA, or at least you're putting new products into FBA, you might you might not know right off the bat the prep and labeling requirements for the product. So it's it's a good reminder to to be able to see that. So let's just say that I this is the products I want to ship, you know, total of four SKUs, 112 units. I'm going to go ahead and create the shipment. All right, we have another person in the waiting room, Diana. Let me <laughs> let me let her in as well. All right, so maybe I'm logged in twice. I'm going to go ahead and create the shipment. And this is something new that we've done just over the past uh, couple of months is um, in traditional box, there was a box view where you add a box and then you scan items into it to pack it. And that worked well for like mixed SKU shipments. I guess I'm printing on packing. Um, and in, in scan power, you always have the option of, of printing expiration labels, item labels, whatever you like at any stage in the process. Um, well, with the new SKU view, it's a little more geared towards wholesale because um, maybe these are already in the in the case packs that they're going to be sent in. Maybe they're even in some cases palletized or they're just grouped together and sorted. And you just want to process them as efficiently as possible. So you can switch from the box view to the SKU view. You can print item labels. You can, if you've already you know, labeled the items, you can very quickly say, okay, I've got, you know, 12 of these um, in a box and I've got four boxes and you can print your box labels as you go. Uh, that's another thing that we've done forever, but can be, can be useful uh, as you're building pallets um, as you go. So that, that's just a, a quick preview of the SKU view, um, you know, packing process. Things get, things get marked as, um, so these, I, I don't know why there's only, a, I, probably because I'd already packed one, but let's put the remaining 11 in a box and print a, print a label for that. And then as you can see, as you pack, items that are fully packed turn green and you know, you know, all these units have been processed. So good visual there. And then once all the items are packed, it's it's the same process of sending contents, uh, purchasing partnered shipping or indicating, you know, putting in PO numbers for non-partnered shipping or, and whatnot that that you're already familiar with. So that's a new feature. That's that's something that um, we're anxious for people to to know about if you sell wholesale products. Um, and then something that is really brand new, never be, before seen, is um, we have joined uh, Amazon's Emerald program, which they're letting some selling partner uh, developers do, which allows us to send notifications directly to Seller Central. So we've got, th this is just some test data that we're working with. We're not live in in their system. So you're not going to start seeing these in Seller Central uh, probably for another week or two, but um, we have pushed a notification, um, you know, straight into Seller Central that basically says, you know, you have 
some products with an FBA prep and ship issue. And then um, when you click on the link, we'll take you back to Boxed and let you address whatever the issue is. We also have, um, we have another one related to expiring products. So you have three products expiring in 90 to 120 days, consider adjusting your price or creating a removal order. So these are some new things that we can do with the Emerald program that we're excited about. Um, and this actually might go back a little to the, the prep center and 3PL conversation because maybe your prep center is handling shipments, maybe they're, they're gonna deal with any shipment related issues, but your expiring products which you wouldn't necessarily be tracking as a, as a prep center client in ScanPower, you can have that surfaced um, into you know, Seller Central. You can also then learn about, we have an expiring products report in ScanPower that you can use to help manage, manage those. So those, those are two new features that I'm excited for people to see and to, to give us some feedback on. Cool. Looks fun. Hey, Diana. Hello, Diana. <laughs> oh, hi. How did I turn off? I was turned off. Uh, the video and sound was turned off. Did you unmute me? Oh, no. so you've been listening to me type away at things. Oh, Luckily, we couldn't hear anything. I was okay. I was speaking too loudly. Oh, good, good. Because I was mur murmuring things under my breath that should not be said live. Um. <laughs> So I jumped in and Paul, shame on you, I should, you, you need to tell me more in advance about these things. Um, I had a question for James because I always forget the answer, but I feel like you touched on this and I think this should be a good one for everybody. So people have prep centers, right? And we're not talking OAR, we're talking wholesale here because like you mentioned, you know, OAR is one thing, but how did they explain to their distributors, this is just my shipping and prepping facility properly and politely, because I feel like I keep having the same conversation. Very good question. And I want to beat my head into the wall. And like, I'm in Jersey, like we are a tax state, but they don't have anything here. They just have a pass-through facility. It arrives and then it leaves. So the way I word it with people, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but is if you say, hey, I have, um, I have a flight to, I don't know, New Jersey and next week or whatever. When you tell someone that, they don't think in their head that you own the plane that you're using another company to get you to New Jersey. When you tell a distributor, I say, here's our location. Here's our warehouse. We have a facility in Fort Worth, Texas, in Jersey City, New Jersey, in wherever, doesn't matter. We have a facility here. Our team is there. Do you really think the distributor cares that the warehouse payroll is not with your logo in the top left-hand corner of their paychecks? No. So I my totally get that. And I'm with you. And when it's my distributor, and let's say I have to send it to you in Texas, I can explain that. But we all know I'm much better at speaking than a lot, but they have this barrier that they run into and they're like, we need a tax certificate for this facility. And I'm like, you have to fill out the out of state one and give it to them. And they look at me like I have 10 heads and I'm like- So, it, okay, go. there's two things, there's two things. One, there's a thing called the multi-jurisdictional multi -jurisdictional tax exemption certificate. Correct. That is one, that's one of many. Um, but they don't have a tax ID in, say, New Jersey or Texas. Can I, can I finish? Yes, sorry. 
that is a form that a lot of people will use and it works. However, in most sales tax states that I've looked at, I can't guarantee all because I've not looked at all of them, but I know for a fact, New Jersey and Texas, both, and I have their forms, have a tax exempt form that does not require the registration of that company in that state. So I can give you a piece of paper, you fill out your name or company name, address, the products you're going to buy, and the, re the tax exempt reason. Because there's other reasons besides, besides resale, religious, government, education, et cetera. But there is a form that all you have to fill out is your company info, no registration number, what you're buying, why you're buying it for tax exempt, and you sign it. That form is just as legal or as compliant as one with a few numbers on it with your sales tax ID. Now, like I said, I know for a fact Texas has it. I know for a fact New Jersey has it. But if you want to go through another state, you need to look up that state. They're hard to find, but most states have them. So we got Jersey and Texas covered. Great. Thank you. Uh, but like Oregon, right? Oregon is a tax exempt state, but they still have a piece of paper because I know that Delaware also still has a piece of paper, even though they're like a tax exempt state. But what the thing is, is that piece of paper, what is that piece of paper for? It just says we're a tax exempt state, go away. <laughs> and, no, no, the, they have a business license in that and state if they want to. Yeah, but they, they don't need a tax exempt for Delaware, they don't need tax exempt for Oregon. Got it. Okay, say hey, charge me sales tax in Oregon, it's 0.0%. 0 .0%. <laughs> so, so you can't ship it to New the, Jersey, huh? And ship it to New New Jersey? No, uh, I'm just saying that um, there are other states that I feel like this is one of these things that. Sorry, guys, my phone is going to die, and I need to put it on charge. There we go. And my electronics are always dying or not working. One of the two things always happens. Same here. Um, I feel like this is something that Scanpower needs to put an article on and link all of these pieces of paper that James is speaking about so that people don't have to Google too hard. And I feel like get Diana's going to ask, ask me to write that article because I already found some of them. <laughs> James, I don't know if you've noticed, we all want you to do all the things because you're just so good at doing them. <laughs> it's just we need to like carbon copy James like 45 times at least. If I had an army of James, oh my God, I would be unstoppable. Yeah, I think ha haven't hasn't that been tried before cloning James? Yeah, it doesn't work. I don't know how to respond to this conversation. First experiment failed. I'm still not giving up though, Paul. I'm not giving up. So the person that's saying this is also the person that tells me I need to work less and take a break. So it's a little bit ironic. Oh no, there's no irony here. There's just full on the disaster of it will be done. If I don't know how I'm going to accomplish this task, but like I'm telling you in the next five years, James will be on a beach and I will be forcing him into a good time of not working and looking at the ocean and the work is magically going to get done by a bunch of James clones. I, and Paul, is this, this is being recorded, right? This is being recorded. <laughs> this, this is... I have five years. I plan to retire in five years and take you with me and just have not figured out how that's going to get. When, when we upload this to YouTube, we'll put a chapter mark right there, James, and <laughs> we can come back. And the big challenge. If Diana's be... prediction came through. We will have to, the big challenge will be whether or not I could get James to try even a beer. That will be the challenge. Not the retirement plan. <laughs> exactly. But we still okay. have gin and tonic waiting for us at the Texas facility. We should really go back. That's true. That, that was a good time and it wasn't this hot. Was it last year? No, it, it was two years ago. Holy moly, mother of God. Hey, Perry. We just, Perry's like, there's gin and tonic hey, and here you go. my whiskey or bourbon or something brown that's supposed to be oh, there. Oh, yeah, there's that too. Um, 
Harry, we need else. we need you to raise the moral standards of this <laughs> of this event. Thank you for joining. Sorry, I, I, I just leave. I just came to help James out. <laughs> <laughs> How's everybody doing today? Good. And I, I think I think this is for Perry. So, um, I, <laughs> yeah. My reputation precedes me. I was going to say I vote for bourbon if he's going to drink anything. Um, uh, no, I just it's been sitting in the warehouse since y'all came down in what September, September or whatever. Yeah. So Teresa, the backstory here is that as James hosted a a big meeting of of the minds. <laughs> Some greater minds and some lesser minds. I put myself in the latter category. Lesser and, uh, mind here. I came to drink. And part of it was <laughs> was brainstorming all the changes that Amazon had in store for us in 2022 and 2023. And all of those came to pass. Although I, I still owe um, pretty much everyone involved some features in scan power, like the manifest and the prep matrix, but we do have some things coming that I think are going to help uh, with some of the, you know, filing claims and, you know, dealing with different types of prep uh, on the product. Um, we, we aren't ready to beta it yet, uh, James, but we're going to be allowing you to, you know, record missing and damaged and reasons for those at the PO level and the receiving process, and then make that available to your, you know, if you're a 3PL, make that available to your clients all in one view so that they can go through and, and resolve issues for all of their stuff and not just, you know, mish, you know, onesie, twosie, batch level things. Um, so that, that's you said beta. Before. You said beta, you mean break? As in James breaks things. Yes. So. Um, yeah. So that, I think that's going to. That's going to help. We, we have. We have another thing that is in beta, which I don't know if you've had a chance to look at. And and Perry, I I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we're, we're making it so that purchase orders and batches are separate. So. Nice. Purchase orders. Uh, you know, you can receive against a purchase order, and then when you're ready to create shipments, you can create shipments out of multiple purchase orders. So you can group products from different orders or receipts into the same shipment or shipment. Yeah, that that was actually going to be my question because I could see how that would have really good applications for not just wholesale but OA as well. Yeah, yeah, because you're re, you know you're getting you you want to track the order but you're not getting the full order and you're not getting everything in one shipment. You're getting multiple shipments. Sometimes right. it's the same SKUs. Yeah. So, so I think the, the short answer is in the new system, which I can, I can give you a, a URL for um, create for each of those shipments, create a purchase order, which ha it has its own a separate screen. I think I have, well, maybe nice. I don't, but um it has a completely separate screen for purchase orders and separate re receiving process and, and just no, you know, James probably thinks it's still a little too um, busy, but no, no extra information that you, you don't need. And then when items have been received and you know, across purchase orders, you can then go to the prep and ship screen and it's just simplified. You can, here, here you see a little document next to the purchase order that means, or next to the batch name, that means that this is, this batch is made up of all purchase order stuff, whereas these other batches are just vanilla batches that you may have you know, listed RA items individually or imported from a spreadsheet or, or whatever. So we kind of have a, a new batch type where you can actually import from purchase orders and across purchase orders. Um, nice. So yeah, that, that should help with wholesale and RA, or sorry, OA. Very cool. 
Well, yeah, I, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just, I heard, I've heard most of the conversation. Um, I have a very different workflow from James. And as I start down wholesale, it's going to be a de different scale as we get started, obviously. Um, wondering if you have any uh, links you could drop in the chat for um, small wholesale operators, or if you could briefly describe the workflow. Like if I create a spreadsheet from, from a basic, you know, PO that I, I generate, how do I get that into a batch? Do you guys have an import feature? Like where, where would a small time operator get started? Yeah, so I, I think in, in the current system, um, let me just delete this batch and I'll, I'll show it from the start. But I think you just create a basic batch. You know, it's not connected to a PO um, other than through your spreadsheet. And then you import okay. from the spreadsheet. Into the batch into the batch and you can you can mess with you know you can verify quantities you can mess with cost and price and enter x you know you can put expiration dates in the spreadsheet or you can enter them manually and it's pretty much you know either select the items individually or import everything it it's in a batch we're going to give you the shipment preview so you know because of my ship from address these are all destined for F day, FWA4. Um, again, this is just a preview. If there were multiple um, destinations, you could kind of filter and select by those destinations. And then, you know, you, you prep the items. You print expiration date labels. Sorry, print, print F and SKU. And uh, I've got mine set up to do, you know, combined. Right. We yeah, do too. expiration date label if it's not a consumable product or a, you know something that requires an expiration date you don't need to worry about that but so once it's in the batch you know you can you can start prepping it at this stage or you can do what i i did previously which was just put it in a shipment and then it's only four SKUs, and it probably came to you somewhat sorted not always but somewhat sorted and and you can just kind of dive right into the shipment level as long as you're not expecting you know high high numbers of damaged or missing goods you can you can kind of do a quick verification at the batch level and then you can jump right into packing and you know that that's what this new flow i think will be useful for for wholesale even at fairly small levels cuz gotcha. it, it's really just you know print your labels throw on an expiration date if you need to and then and then pack it and the box information is you know rather than having to onesie twosies create your boxes you just say i I've, I've got you know two units per box and I've got five boxes and box dimensions and weight, print your box labels, put that on the box and then move on to the next, next item. Very helpful. Thank you can you. always go back and reprint box labels. You can always go back and reprint item labels. If something gets, you know, scratched off or you just forgot it, there's, there's ways to fix and address any of those things that at any stage. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. One of the things I was hoping to cover and we're, we're already over time a little bit, but if you have a few more minutes, I'd love to hear um, kind of your experience with LTL and um, I mentioned this to James earlier. What's your mix when you're doing LTL? What's your mix of partnered versus non-partnered? Why do you choose one over the other? Of course, uh, you can't send hazmat items and partnered LTL, but um, but what are some of the, you know, once you get to the scale that you're starting to do LTL shipments, what are some of the considerations? Uh, are you asking yeah. me? Personally, everyone. Okay, oh, James. 
Got it. Uh, I would say that we have progressed through all the phases of that. Obviously, early on, we were just doing small parcel. Then we started doing um, LTL, um, but it was like one pallet here, one pallet there, which is probably close to what Perry's at, an occasional pallet here and there. Um, it really comes down to the volume and the frequency. So how much and how often um, we're shipping out between 50 and 75 pallets a week usually. So we're doing a lot of non-partnered where we control the freight, we control when it's picked up and et cetera. Um, partnered, we still use for some oversized shipments just because the distance and the, the price, all that stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we like non-partnered if we can control the freight. If, um, if it goes through a broker, non-partner does, I mean, everyone loves to talk about, oh, well, non-partner is going to maybe check in faster. Well, there's also detention fees. Well, there's storage fees if it if the appointments are pushed out. There are other fees for, for the carriers can provide or can incur on you um, that people don't talk about. Um, uh, remeasure fees, reclass fees, uh, storage fees, if, if there's not appointments, can add up very, very um, uh, very substantially. Um, so there's pros and cons. Um, in general, you don't really have a huge benefit to looking at um, dedicated freight until you start filling trucks. Do you need to fill a truck with 26 pallets? No. Do you need to fill a truck with more than maybe like one or two pallets? Yes. Um, partner carrier absolutely has a purpose and a place, but at the end of the day, um, there are pros and cons to it and there are pros and cons to non-partnered which means there isn't a black and white solution that you should always use one or the other and the rates are totally different depending on where you're inbounding into like correct i think diana and james you guys can get pretty good just like partnered ltl you might what pay Twenty dollars, sixteen dollars a pallet to go to the well. Our center non, near you. Our partner is going to be more, but our non-partner trucks um, can be anywhere between. I mean, it really depends on the FC, the time of year, and all the other stuff. But right now, I just shipped out a truck for three hundred dollars. That's a full truckload. So. Uh, Non-partner is great, except when the FC decides not to have any live on load. And then it's a free-for-all. And I am in the midst of, you know, the busiest hubs. And one of my warehouses has been um, drop trailers since what, James, June. <laughs> so I'm sort of like, okay, you won a thousand dollars in my first board, but it'll get unloaded today. Okay. There are problems with all of it. Like you need to have a backup for the backup and then a backup in case your backup fails. So it's not fun. So you've and had to schedule, you've just had to schedule more partnered inbound to make up for the non-partner that they're not unloading. So what I had to do is revert back to what I used to do. But now I don't have a trailer of my own. So what I used to do is have a trailer of my own and have one. What the hell's going on? People are calling me. Sorry. So I would hire a driver. And then drivers became magic unicorns during COVID. So I lost the driver, got rid of the trailer. So now I'm paying the guys who held on to the drivers and held on to the trailers who have Carrier Central. So in Carrier Central, appointments are readily available for live on load, but you have to have a driver in the trailer. And in New Jersey, if you could have a trailer, it's going to be great, but you can get a driver. And if you have a driver, chances are they don't have their own trailer. And it's just a mishmash. So I'm paying these private carriers in Jersey who have drivers and trailers and who book appointments every single day. 
And in Carrier Central, the difference between that and Amazon Freight is that you could still mess with the pro numbers and FBA IDs, and it, it doesn't change the delivery date. Like if I go into my Amazon Freight right now and try to change my schedule truck, it's going to change the date. It's no longer going to be like tomorrow. It's going to be like a few days out. So that's fun. <laughs> yeah. And it's so much specialized knowledge that, you know, this, this is what, you know, this is why you have a 3PL is to, to navigate these things for you. Right. Or stupid find a people. weird, find a weird people, a weird, yeah. Yeah, a weird person like me that enjoys it for some reason. Don't know right. Why. Or, or find a person, a weird person's friend who yeah. thought they enjoy it. I, it used to be better. It used to be easier. It used to be sane. Amazon and easy, really? Well, when Amazon had no rules, you just made them up. To 2010 to 2014, 15, it, it was pretty, it was pretty easy. I mean. 2010, but, I was 12 years old. So like, <laughs> So <laughs> FBA I mean, was, you know, four years old. Everybody keeps saying this, but you know, there was beta FBA. Like there was that magic time where you put things in a box, you didn't label it and you got a UPS label and a man in brown showed up and picked up the box and you didn't have to pay UPS to come pick it up. And you like in the first few rounds, you didn't even have to pay for the label. And here's the thing, yeah. like, if there was no listing for that item, you just made up the listing and it's stuck. There's still listings that I personally created like more than a decade ago that still exist on Amazon. They're, they're not good listings. Do not go looking for them. They're terrible, but they still exist and sell and somebody is selling on them. And there are brands to whom I own lots of, lots of apologies, but that was easy. No storage fees. I mean, that, what of course, fees? What, fee, what no, fees are you talking about? Yeah. There was like no pick and pack at some point, I remember. It was like some you, random you mean, you mean there wasn't a, a firstborn or a left kidney fee? <laughs> I, no. I, my account's not that old, but I do remember where they didn't charge storage fees if you only had one of an item in stock. Right. We said we started with books because of that. But yeah, I never thought I'd be selling on Amazon long enough to think, oh, those were the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> but boy, do I now, you know? Oh, well, for sure. I need to I need to head off, but I appreciate the chat. Yeah, I think I think this is a great time for us to to wrap things up. We've covered a lot of territory, and I really appreciate all of you tuning in and and you four for joining. Um, so much great content. If you want one of the new and improved Scan Power hats, leave me a comment in, in the chats. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll DM you for an address to ship it to. Uh, we are also, because we're not going to be around next week before the show, we're announcing a um, a special WS United coupon. Looks like I just auto-corrected. I mean, 10% uh, off for six, your first six months to new customers if you sign up for ScanPower. Um, we're going to also be giving out this coupon code at the, at the uh, wholesale conference, Amazon United, which there's a link to in the chat. Um, Join us if you can. I think there's probably still some tickets available. Um, but thanks again, everyone, for tuning in today. And uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Over to. It'll be exciting. I have Jen. <laughs> Whoop.